The following Pharma Essentia podcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and cannot be considered as medical advice. Please speak to a healthcare professional before making any treatment decisions. Hi, Kay. Hi, Josh. And hello, listeners. It's been a minute. Sure has. Well, welcome back to the PV Pod. Stories from the Marrow. Brought to you by Pharma, Pharma Essentia. Essentia. It's right about that time. Lunchtime. You love a lunch. I certainly do. Close guess, but I'm talking about the new year, the dark, cold winter. Depending on where you live. It's a time of reflection, a time of change. And for some, it can be a time of struggle. Right. I have mixed feelings about the winter time. On one hand, there's a lot less light, and I know that affects my energy levels, and if I'm not careful, that can lead to seasonal depression, which will then, in turn, start affecting my decision-making. And that can all spiral into me becoming very unhappy with my choices when it comes back around to springtime and I start to feel that solar boost again. A good reminder to go for a run after work today. Thanks, Josh. (laughs) But what's the flip side of this? I love the way things slow down and how much time you have to think and be present and reflect on things and the outfits. Hold it. You know I love a good outfit story. But go back to that last part. Right. Yes. Thank you. This, the wintertime, it's a time of thinking and reflecting. And along with that often comes the setting of new goals. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today with the help of a new friend. My name is Aaron Gerds. I'm an associate professor of medicine at the Cleveland Clinic Taza Cancer Institute, where I also serve as the deputy director for clinical research. I'm also the medical director for the clinical research office of the Case Comprehensive Cancer Center. Hi, Dr. Gertz. It's been a few months since our last episode, and with the new year upon us, this felt like the perfect time to talk to a clinician about the importance of setting treatment goals in polycythemia vera. How to work with your care team to stick to those goals. And when to get a second opinion. Where do we start? How about the importance of treatment? It's incredibly important to treat polycythemia vera, namely because there are lots of complications that can happen as a result of the disease. We do think of it as a chronic disease, meaning that people can live many years even without treatment, but that's uh, certainly not maximizing the quality and quantity of life that is potential with polycythemia vera. And certainly uh, diagnosing it or finding it out, uh, getting the correct label on it, understanding the risk, and then applying the right treatment is critically important. Maximizing the quality and quantity of life. That is my new mantra, my resolution, if you will. That's a good goal for anyone, especially when discovering a new diagnosis for something like polycythemia vera. Which actually leads me to my next question, funny enough. If it's possible to live many years without treatment, how soon after diagnosis should a person look to start their treatment? Well, it's certainly not an emergency. We don't have to rush people into the hospital to start treatment right away, but you know, we do want to take care of it quickly. Most serious events that we see happen with polycythemia vera, namely blood clots, happen within the first three years of diagnosis. So putting it off for several months to a year is probably not the best plan. So we definitely want to make the diagnosis and then start in right away with treatment. More importantly, most people are symptomatic, or a lot of people are quite symptomatic with the disease. And so obviously getting the disease under better control can lead to people feeling better. And we would want to do that as quickly as possible as well. So in short, you want to get on some sort of treatment plan quickly. But it's not typically an urgent emergency, rush you to the hospital type situation. Right. Identifying the problem, finding the correct label and treatment, and then executing a plan for treatment can take a little bit of time. And in many cases, that's just fine. I love it when a plan comes together. Now that we have the context, let's talk about goal setting. My first question for this is about understanding the clinical side. What are the goals of the clinicians when it comes to treating PV? The first and primary goal is to avoid the serious consequences of the disease. The one that is the most common are blood clot, both in the venous system as well as the arterial system. There are other events that can happen, progression to myelofibrosis. A rare form of bone marrow cancer that disrupts blood cell production. Or to acute leukemia, and we want to avoid those if we can. To the best of our knowledge, there aren't a lot of medications that are available that can do that, but certainly there are several medications that have been used historically that can accelerate that progression, and we want to avoid using those. Pause there for a second. This is fantastic information to have. Understanding medication and all the possible side effects can be beyond overwhelming. So going into a meeting with your doctor armed with the right questions can help get you all the information you need to make a decision about what treatment is right for you and your goals. What goes hand in hand with those 
avoiding the consequences of the disease is treating the symptoms that might be associated with polycythemia vera, such as night sweats, weight loss, fevers, itchy skin, abdominal discomfort, and enlarged spleen. All those things need to be addressed as well, in addition to trying to avoid the complications or reduce the risk of the complications of the disease. So it's not just about treating the cancer itself. Treating the symptoms that come along with polycythemia vera is just as important. So that's the clinical side. But what about the goals of the patient? That's where good communication comes in. Isn't that right, Dr. Gerds? I think that's a really important point to discuss treatment goals with your doctor because one individual treatment goal may not be the same as the next. So everyone prioritizes what they want to get out of their treatment based on their life experiences and their perspectives and what risks they're willing to take. And so I think having that shared decision making is really important. And for any given individual, those treatment goals might be a little bit different. So things may look different for each individual in some ways, but are there any parts of treatment that should look the same for everyone? There are a couple unmutable truths, as we say, in polycythemia vera. One is keeping the hematocrit under 45%, and that's something that comes up over and over again. It's been well established as a treatment goal in terms of a goal to minimize complications of the disease, namely blood clots and blood clot-associated death. And that's all based on this trial that was done a while ago called the CytoPV trial, where half the patients in the trial had their hematocrit under 45%, and the other half had their hematocrit from 45 to 50%. And by keeping that hematocrit under tighter control, we saw that the risk of blood clots and blood clots associated death was cut in about half compared to the other group. So a really important thing that we can do to help minimize those complications. Wow, just a difference of 5% when it comes to hematocrit levels can make a tremendous difference. Are there any other similarities when it comes to treating all people with PV? The other kind of truth, if you will, in polycythemia vera as we know it today, it comes from this other study called the ECLAP study where Half the patients got low-dose daily aspirin, and the other half didn't, and aspirin reduced the risk of blood clots and blood clots associated death. So really, that's the starting point of coming up with a treatment plan for anyone with polycythemia vera, is how can we best keep the hematocrit under 45% for that individual, and then the use of a low-dose daily aspirin, and whether that might be applicable for that individual. And then from there, we can start to figure out the different ways to keep the hematocrit under 45%, whether we're talking about phlebotomies or a medication. So clearly there are a few constants that can ring true for all patients, and those are really important to know going in. But getting back to the goals of the individual. Kay, you mentioned good communication, but I'm curious to know exactly what that looks like. Yeah. Dr. Gerds, what's a good way for a PV patient to communicate their goals with their clinician? And what does pushback look like if those goals are maybe less likely to be achievable? As I alluded earlier, in shared decision making is so incredibly important for all patients, no matter what the disorder is. And I think just being, in my opinion, being straightforward and blunt about it and say, hey, this is what I want to get out of my treatment. And this is what I'm willing to risk and not willing to risk to get to those goals. And trying to establish the boundaries of that relationship pretty quickly and what you're thinking. That way, the treating doctor can hear that and get that in their frame of mind as they're going forward with the discussion. So it really is about both parties being clear and talking it out. I like the part he said about setting boundaries. Yeah, actually, I never thought about that with a doctor. I feel like every time I see a doctor, I'm so focused on being compliant that I sometimes leave feeling like I wasted the entire visit. It's always a good idea to prepare for a doctor's visit like you would for a meeting with your boss at work. How do you mean? Well, the way I see it, if you make some notes ahead of time that you can reference when you're there, say, about your health goals and life goals, and now that I'm listening to Dr. Gerds, maybe adding in some thoughtfulness around what risks you're willing to take, then you'll be ready to have a productive conversation and not feel so lost. That's great advice. It reminds me of an interview with a patient I was on last year. The patient had asked her doctor for permission to use the recording app on her phone so that she could review their conversations in more detail when she got home. Yes, another great way to make sure you're getting the most out of your visit. There's nothing worse than leaving a doctor's visit feeling like so much happened that you can't remember any of it. And I also don't like the feeling of not speaking up because I don't know the right questions to ask or how to ask it. A clinician should always be willing to hear what you have to say and be willing to work with you towards making your goals achievable in the most realistic way by clearly expressing risks, managing expectations, and giving the patient the information they need in order to make the right decision for how each individual wants to live their life after diagnosis. But what if your doctor doesn't? I'm sorry? Well, look, to be fair, not all clinicians are the same. 
Some get more detailed schooling about rare diseases than others. Some like to follow protocol and do things strictly by the book. Some believe that the book, in a manner of speaking, is outdated and that new treatments are the future of care. So what happens when you express your goals with your clinician and you don't feel heard? Or you feel pressure to adhere to a treatment that just doesn't feel like a perfect fit? I think one of the things that patients sometimes don't know about or may struggle with is second opinions. Polycythemia vera is not terribly common. It's not like diabetes or hypertension, high blood pressure, things that are very common in the medical world. In fact, if you take all the myeloproliferative neoplasms, PV, ET, myelofibrosis, put them all together, there's about 300,000 people in this country living with those diseases. It's classified technically as a rare disease by the NIH. Some docs may see one or two or three patients per year with polycythemia vera and not really have a kind of a finger on the pulse of what's going on in the field. And so I always encourage patients to go get a second opinion from a center that specializes in the treatment of the MPNs or polycythemia vera. That way they can, at a minimum, you go and you get the same information and you're reassured that you're on the right track. And sometimes there may be something there that's subtle that may not have been picked up on that could change the way you think about your disease or the way we go about treating your disease. I can't overemphasize the importance of getting a second opinion from an NPN specialist. Wow, great call with that last question, Josh. Thanks. You know, I was thinking about all this and putting myself in the shoes of the person with the diagnosis. And, well, look, when my wife and I go out to dinner and the food comes out wrong, I'm the type of person who will say nothing and just eat it, even if I know it's going to make me sick later. But my wife, who works in a restaurant, will always say, they don't care. You can just send it back. You have to do what's right for you and your body. Well, look, it's not lunch yet, but it sounds like you need a snack break. You see the correlation I'm making, right? Sure. Well, yeah, it's an analogy. The food represents the medication. So, like, if you get the wrong food or, I mean, Where's that medication, it starts to make you sick. I mean, or, it runs a risk. Much better. No. Hold on. We'll hear more from Dr. Gerds right after this quick snack break. So you're learning about PV on the PV Pod Stories from the Marrow. Now get ready to take the next steps on your PV journey with What's Next PV, an educational site on polycythemia vera. Knowing what's next can help inform the decisions you and your doctor make about the future and is important to your health. What's Next PV can help you understand test results, set goals for the management of your PV, and make a plan to advocate for yourself. Check out www.pvbonemarrow.com to learn more. And we're back. How was that granola bar? It had chocolate in it. Okay. So we have discovered what shared decision-making looks like and what the goals of the clinician are when it comes to treating polycythemia vera. We've talked about the importance of getting a second opinion when it comes to finding the right treatment plan for you. But there's something missing here. Yeah. Well, what exactly are the options for treatment? Exactly. And the first question on the mind of any newly diagnosed person, I imagine, has to be, is there a cure for this? The only thing that can potentially cure polycythemia vera would be a bone marrow or stem cell transplant. And of course, that procedure comes with a lot of risk, and the risks far outweigh the benefits from that potential procedure. So really, transplant is really reserved for patients with disease that has progressed to uh, myelofibrosis or more of an accelerated or blast phase disease, that disease that's kind of like acute leukemia. Got it. So it seems like a cure could be the result of a drastic effort to treat late-stage aggressive symptoms and includes far more risks than benefits. So what about the more common treatments? What do they look like? For most patients with chronic phase polycythemia vera, the treatment's in two bins. One is phlebotomy. So phlebotomy works by taking out a pint of blood. We remove a lot of iron and ultimately patients become iron deficient. And that iron deficiency then slows down the production of red blood cells, keeping that hematocrit again under 45%. The other type of treatment in polycythemia vera are what we call cytoreductive agents or medicines designed to control the counts. So we don't have to use phlebotomies or iron deficiency to control the hematocrit. We use a medication instead. And there are some major categories there. Drugs like hydroxyurea have been around for a long time. We also use JAK inhibitors and interferons as well. We won't get super into detail about specific treatments and medications here because that's a conversation each individual will want to have with their doctor. 
So once you pick a medication or treatment, how do you know if it's working? I think there's kind of two fronts on that. One is, are you able to keep that hematocrit under 45%? And with that approach that you're using, are you running into a lot of side effects? So in the case of phlebotomy, is regular phlebotomy, hopefully not too frequently, intermittent phlebotomy, is it keeping the hematocrit reliably under 45%? And are you having any side effects from that iron deficiency, like achy joints or changes in the hair or nails or just the kind of queasy feeling after the phlebotomy that's really intolerable. So are there any issues with the phlebotomy and is it keeping them adequate under that 45%? So that's kind of a simple way of saying, is it working for you? And similarly with a medication, the questions are the same. So is that medication keeping them adequate under 45% reliably? And are you having any major side effects from those medications that makes it difficult to continue to use it? Okay, so how often should you be checking on your treatment process and assessing if it's working or not? Early on, we generally see people quite often as we're getting things under control. Say you're diagnosed with polycythemia vera, we might be doing phlebotomies weekly every other week or at least every three or four weeks to try to get things under control quickly. You might be seen more often during that time, maybe every two weeks to every month, just to make sure we're getting on the right track and things are getting under control. For a lot of patients though, once you get through that initial control of the disease, the appointments space out quite a bit. So there are a lot of patients, for example, that are on phlebotomies, that it's pretty predictable about every three months or so they need a phlebotomy. So we quite simply schedule their blood counts and their follow-up visits at those times because we get that much out of every phlebotomy. In the same vein, a patient who's on a medication to control their counts, once they're on a stable dose, we know that things aren't fluctuating wildly we can space those visits out to say every month to every three months or even longer. So that's what it looks like if it's going well. But what about those side effects we discussed earlier? What happens if you start experiencing those and they are maybe more intense than you expected or you're experiencing something completely unexpected? In the event of any side effects, open up that channel of communication. Let your doctors know that you are potentially having a side effect because the first question is well is it truly from the medication or is it something else that we need to go address sorting through that triage if you will and if it is a side effect are there things that we can do to get rid of it reducing the dose changing the way the medications dosed if it is a medication or in the event that this is probably not going to go away with some simple manipulations should we be thinking about an alternative medication if you're allergic to dairy and your meal comes with cheese on it you don't have to eat it. You can talk to your server and get a meal that's right for you. You did like my analogy. Well, it's not a perfect fit for this. I just think I'm getting a little hungry now, too. Brutal. Well, so I have two more questions as we get to the end of our episode here. Go for it. Say you're experiencing some side effects or the treatment you chose isn't controlling your blood counts. How do you go about making the decision to change your treatment? There are well-established guidelines to outline when we might consider changing treatment. There's these things called the ELN guidelines or European Leukemia Net that have kind of started that conversation in polycythemia vera. And it basically says that if you're on a decent dose of a medication or you're getting really regular phlebotomies or you're running into side effects or intolerance of the phlebotomies that limit the ability to use that treatment, you should think about switching to something else. So for example, if a person is on phlebotomies and boy, we're having to do a phlebotomy once a month, and that's just a lot for that individual, then that might say, okay, this is not the right approach. We just switch to a medication. And if they're on a medication and that hematocrit is routinely above 45 and we're having to supplement with phlebotomies or change the dose, or we've hit the maximum dose for that medication and it's still not under 45, then, then we should switch treatments. Or with any medication, of course, if we're running into side effects and they're not easily amenable to, to, to minor changes to get those under control, then switch to another medication. Okay, and I guess my last question then kind of loops us back to the beginning of all of this, to that initial discussion with your clinician. Dr. Gerds, what would you suggest as far as questions that patients should ask their doctors about their treatments? In that initial discussion with your doctor, there are three things that need to be covered. The first thing is, what is it? What is the diagnosis? How did you arrive at the diagnosis? What is it called? Where is it within the larger collection of diseases? Where does it sit within that? That's the first question that needs to be answered. The second question is, well, how bad is it? What is the prognosis? What can I expect in the next month, the next year, the next five years, the next 10 years? Just so you can get a sense of where we're going with all this. Because without answering those first two questions, you can't answer the third question. What are we going to do about it? What's the best way to go about treatments? In that initial conversation, it's always important to say, what is it? How bad is it? And what are we going to do about it? And then you can fill in the nuances in between that. But 
as long as you're hitting those kind of three major touchstones, I think you're going to get all the basic information you need about your disease, your prognosis, and your treatment plan. This has been an incredible episode, so informative and helpful. But Josh, it is getting to be about that time. The new year. It's already here, okay? No, lunch. I'm genuinely starving now. Oh, okay. Yeah, let's lunch. Thank you, Dr. Aaron Gerds, for speaking with us today. And to you listeners for being with us. We'll have more stories from patients and clinicians next time on the PV Pod. Stories from the Marrow. The PV Pod Stories from the Marrow is produced by Believe Limited and Bloodstream Media and made possible thanks to our sponsor, Pharma Essentia. The PV Pod is hosted by me, Kay Vermeil, and my co host, Josh Bragg. If you like the show, please share it with anyone for whom it might make a difference and leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. We'll see you next time.